Luke 23, and I'm going to start reading at verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's where we'll stop. I really love this passage because it shows, it shows God's great mercy and grace to somebody who is truly a very terrible sinner. We're going to look at the text, we're going to talk about some truth, and we're going to talk about some application for us. So first of all, the text, in verse 39 there, it says when what we read, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him. That first criminal literally blasphemes Jesus. That's the word that is actually in Greek. Blasphemeo is the way it is. He goes even farther than everybody, everybody else. Everybody else was ridiculing him. But this guy, he goes farther. He even blasphemes Jesus. That basically means that you mock God. You deny his power. And that's what was going on here. He blasphemes Jesus. So he's kind of at the lowest of the low. And then in verse 40, there's that second criminal there, and he can't believe the arrogance of that first guy. He just can't believe what he's hearing. This blasphemy. Don't you fear God? You are under the same sentence as He is. Okay, you have one crucified person, and you have another crucified person, and you, being crucified, think that you are in a place to judge somebody else who is crucified. What? No. You're, you're about to die right now, and still you're not humbling yourself before God. You're still defiant and arrogant. Don't you fear God when you are on your deathbed, even? And he is innocent. We aren't. But he is. Why are, why are you judging him when he's done nothing wrong and we have? Who, who do you think you are? Verse 41, this man has done nothing wrong. This man is innocent and we are not. This is the sixth time in Luke where somebody is declaring Jesus innocent. The sixth time. Luke wants to really drive it home that Jesus has done nothing wrong. He is simply guilty or pronounced guilty because of a rigged trial. In Luke 23, verse 4, verse 14, verse 15, twice in verse 15, and in verse 22, he is all declared to be innocent there too. So, just a couple verses. You brought me, this is Pilate speaking, you brought me this man as one who is misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. That wasn't good enough. He's not guilty, but crucify him anyways. In verse 42, Jesus' words in response to this second criminal here, or excuse me, rather, this criminal's final words to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I love the humility there. He just pronounces... You have done nothing wrong, Jesus. You are here simply because 
of this lynch mob that has put you here. But you are, you are really, you really are the king of the Jews. So would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He doesn't ask to be seated at the right hand or the left hand. He doesn't ask for a special position. He doesn't ask that Jesus take him down from the cross right now, as you know, we might expect. He just simply says, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? This guy is, this guy is great. And this request is similar to some, the, some funeral expressions that are inscribed in some stones and some places where people are buried from that time. May, may he be counted among the righteous. This criminal, he's saying, Lord, I believe that on the last day that you are going to be the king and you are going to be made king there. So when that day comes, would you remember me? I, I, I believe that that's going to happen. So when that day comes, would you remember me? So he's asking to be in that number when the, when the saints go marching in. But Jesus' response is a little surprising to this man. Jesus responds in verse 43 that it won't be someday, but today. Not later you'll be with me in paradise, or on that day you'll be with me in paradise. No, today. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today. You notice that he doesn't say, well, you're kind of, you're kind of a pretty bad sinner. You've done a lot of bad things, so you got a little time in purgatory first that you've got to work off some of that. But after that, then you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't say that. He also doesn't say, you know, we're, we, when you're going to sleep for a while, something called soul sleep, you know, so you're just going to be asleep until the last day, and then you'll be with me in paradise. No. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Similar to what Jesus said to Martha at the funeral of Lazarus. This is something that I read at almost every devotional time at every funeral that I've done. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? This second criminal does. He just believes it. So some truth that we can glean from this passage. In ourselves, just by ourselves, without God's help, we are all like this first criminal. This is, this is us. In Romans 8, verse 7, it says, The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Not indifferent, but hostile. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It's in our nature to be like this first criminal, to assume that God is here to serve us, to do what we want to take us down from our crosses or whatever problems that we might be going through. It's in our nature to mock God's power when it doesn't do what we want it to do. When we can't manipulate God, we will mock him and say, well, maybe you're not that strong after all. And it's in our nature to reject Christ when his way means suffering. Especially in suffering We have two responses to that usually, we as human beings, and one of them is the way of this first criminal. God, if you were really there, if you were really powerful, and if you were really good, then you would do what I want. Then you would give me relief from my problems, or relief from my suffering, and it would be fine with me. And if you don't do that, then you must not be God. You must not be there. 
when, when we're suffering and our anxiety is that high, we tend, to, tend, we tend to lash out. Unless the Spirit has been working in us and we have the humility to recognize what is really going on. Like that second criminal. We deserve to die. We're getting what our deeds deserve. But Jesus, He's done nothing wrong. And He's suffering more than any of us. It says in the Bible that we all like sheep have gone astray. In Isaiah 53 verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He's done nothing wrong, but we have. It's our fault that he's on the cross. So, by ourselves, without the Spirit's help, we are like this first criminal. And this change of heart in the second criminal is nothing short of miraculous, really. This was an amazing thing that happened here. It says in the Bible that salvation is not a helping hand. It's a resurrection. We were dead in our sins and God made us alive with Christ. It says in Ephesians 2. So in the case of this guy and in the life of Jesus, people saw Jesus heal the sick and they didn't believe. People saw Jesus exercise demons out of people and they didn't believe. People saw Jesus feed 5,000 just men, let alone women and children, with five loaves and two fish, and they didn't believe. People saw him raise the dead, and they didn't believe. In fact, they conspired to kill the man that they raised, he raised from the dead, so that there would be no evidence. But this guy, this second criminal... He hasn't seen any of that, or we have no reason to think he did. This criminal sees Jesus helplessly defeated on a cross, and he believes. That's all he has to go on. Here's this guy who has done nothing wrong, and he's on a cross. That's all he has. And somehow he believes. He didn't see any of those miracles, or at least we have no reason to think he did. And... Even in this whole thing of Jesus being crucified, the sky hadn't turned dark yet. There was nothing miraculous that had happened yet. There was no earth shaking, no curtain torn in two, no dead people rising or anything like that. He might have heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. He might have heard that. But this is a crucifixion. There's a lot of commotion. Who knows? It's amazing that this guy believed. So not even those who were with Jesus 24-7 for the past three years were even here. When he was arrested, they all left. And when he rose again, they still had a hard time believing him. And one even said, you know what, unless I touch him and see him with my own eyes, I'm not believing And this guy just meets Jesus and he believes. This is nothing short of miraculous. This is incredible that this guy believes. Until this point, the second criminal is actually no different from the first. In both Matthew and Mark, it says... Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And not, it doesn't say just one reviled him, it says both did. So at least at first, this second guy was just like the first. And then something happened that clicked. And I think the, the only thing that we can conclude here is that the Holy Spirit did some amazing work in a short amount of time. It's not that good people choose Jesus and bad people don't. That's not how it works. All of us are sinners, and we're all like that first criminal. 
The second one is actually no better than the first. But it was miraculous what happened here. Another truth. Jesus saves even the worst of the worst sinners. He doesn't just save pretty good people, people who commit just some small sins. No, He saves the worst of the worst. You dig out and from the bottom of the barrel of society and you pull out some poor, terrible person who's done the worst things in this life and Jesus can forgive that. This criminal here, he was a maximum security felon. This is not a guy who was arrested for petty theft. You don't get crucified for stealing a loaf of bread. You get crucified if you're an enemy of the state. If you are standing up as a revolutionary against Rome, that's when they crucify you. This man actually was a terrorist. He would fit our definition of a terrorist. It says in Mark 15, verse 7, it says, Among the rebels, plural, in prison, who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. In other words, Barabbas wasn't alone. He had some people helping him. There were rebels in prison. There were a few of them, or at least a few. And Barabbas was let go. These two guys were not. And they had committed murder in the insurrection. These guys are terrorists. They want to overthrow Rome, and they're going to kill people and cause terror to do it. Jesus can forgive terrorists. Even terrorists. If he can forgive a terrorist, then it doesn't matter what you've done. He can forgive that. I've actually had people say to me before, I, I've done some terrible things and I don't think that God would forgive me. No, absolutely not. Jesus can forgive a terrorist. He can forgive you too. Jesus saves people when they are at rock bottom. This guy was at rock bottom. He had nothing left to live for. He was on his deathbed. When you're on the cross, you are... Basically exposed to the worst shame possible. Agony, the worst agony possible. You are a symbol of defeat and hopelessness. When you're put on a cross, you will not come down alive. You're, you're done. You're done. And it's, we're going to draw it out and make it as most painful and shameful as possible. So this guy is at rock bottom. And Jesus can save you when you're at rock bottom. Sometimes it takes rock bottom for us to finally wake up, doesn't it? And to actually humble ourselves before God and to say, God, I need you. I can't do it on myself, my own. And Jesus saves people when they are on their deathbed. That's figuratively, he's, he's not on a bed, he's on a cross, but he's about to die. He's not going to last much longer. And Jesus saves him. He gives him a word of salvation. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, an 11th hour conversion is not advisable. It's not a good idea to just kind of live your life without Christ and then when you're on your deathbed to say, oh, okay, yeah, now I'll do it. That is definitely not what you would want. Not to mention... For everything there is a season, as it says in Ecclesiastes, a time to be born and a time to die. And a little later on it says, for man does not know his time. We don't know what time it is. Death can come very quickly on us when we're unsuspecting. It's so much better to know Christ now anyways. To have the joy and the hope and the peace that comes from knowing Him and having Him and to belong body and soul and life and death to Jesus Christ right now, you get joy and hope and peace from that 
that you can't get anywhere else. But people can be saved on their deathbed. You can. This guy is one example. And Jesus saves by faith alone. This is a typical Protestant sort of a thing, but Jesus saves just on faith alone. This guy, has, was a, he was a bad guy. He was a terrorist. He hadn't done anything good. He had no chance to do good works afterwards either. He's about to die. He, he could do nothing to save himself except believe, and that was enough. That was enough. By faith alone. Now we do talk about how it's not faith only. We can't just say, I believe, and then do whatever we want. That's not how it works. If you believe, then you will change your life. If you actually love God, you're not going to do the things that hurt him. That makes sense. But it's not good works or sacraments that save us. This guy had none of those things. He was saved on faith alone. That's it. Look at the screen here and let's answer this together. How are you right with God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ, even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, Nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. As if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me, all I need to do is to accept this gift of God with a believing heart. That's all we have to do. We need to believe. We need to love the Lord. So some things to take home with you today. Some application. Jesus saves even the worst of the worst sinners. Your sin is never too great for Jesus to forgive. I want to drive that home because I've actually had people say, My sin is too great for God to forgive. No, that is not true. There's no sin that Christ cannot forgive when you go to Him and ask for forgiveness. The church is not a place for good and righteous and awesome people. It's a place for sinners. I hope that when you came in this door, you didn't come in thinking, I'm a good person, I'm... I'm great, I, I believe the right things, and so I'm, I'm set. And no, if you believe the right things, then you believe that you are a sinner. And you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. That's it. 1 Corinthians 6. I like, I like what this says here. Because it talks about how the church is made up, not of good people who have their lives together, but of sinners who are recovering and saved. It says, Do not be deceived, Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. That's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That's what you used to be. But not anymore. You were washed from that. So if it's blasphemy, if it's terrorism that you're guilty of, you can be forgiven. If he can forgive the people who crucified him, he can forgive you and I. Jesus saves people when they are on their deathbed. So pray for your loved ones to accept Christ till the very end, until their last moments. Don't stop praying for them to accept Christ. Because up until the very end, this guy was just like the first criminal. He was criticizing Christ 
until that moment at the very end. Salvation is a, is a miracle of God. It doesn't depend on our persuasive arguments. It doesn't depend on us saying the right things to the right person at the right time. We need to be wise about what we say, but it doesn't depend on us. The salvation is a miraculous act of God. So pray for your loved ones who don't know Christ to be saved. And pray until the very end. Because you don't know how great God is capable of turning somebody around, even in a short period of time. We have no idea. For us to be saved, this passage kind of gives us what that means or what we have to do for that. To be saved, to have that faith, we must first acknowledge our guilt, just like this guy did. We deserve to die. We are getting what our deeds deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. The wages of sin is death. We deserve to die. There is trouble and distress for everyone who sins, it says in the Bible. We need to acknowledge that we are sinners and we need the grace of God. That's our first thing. The second thing is that we must confess Jesus as our Savior and Lord, like this guy did. He called him by his name. He said, Jesus. Jesus' name means the Lord saves. He is our Savior. And He's not just our Savior, He's also our Lord. We obey Him. We do what He says. He's our Master. He says, Your kingdom. Jesus is our King. <coughs> Third, we must trust in His deliverance, in His time, and in His way. We might not come down from the cross. But we can trust that God will give us deliverance in His time and in His way. And we can be with Him today. Today we can have Christ as our Savior. I want to encourage you, if you've never done that, to talk to the Lord today. Make Him your Lord and Savior today. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, our, our Father, we're thankful that you sent Jesus Christ to give us this message of salvation even to a dying terrorist on his deathbed. Oh Lord, what an amazing thing it was that you turned somebody like that around in a short period of time. The Lord, help us to be inspired by this we pray that we would pray for those who need you. And Lord, that we would each day repent of our sins and embrace you as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.